Hello and welcome to this week's YouTube video extravaganza. This video is a question and answer video with questions from my summer sessions of uh, digital photography classes at Highline College. Uh, so uh, you'll get to see some real live questions from students and then some semi-live answers from me. Um, so uh, this is gonna take a little while. There, usually this takes about 45 minutes to an hour to answer the questions and we'll see how we do today. Um, so grab a beverage, take a break, hit the pause as you need. Uh, I will put the chapter markers below so you can jump to the sections that are most interesting to you. So before we begin, a couple things. First, my uh, number one answer likely will be it depends. It depends. Uh, there are so many variables, it's hard to give a specific answer. Uh, and sometimes personal preferences are the most important part of the answer. So I'll, in those situations, I'll discuss uh, what preferences you might want to consider and uh, use them in uh, making your own decision. Uh, the second thing I want to say before we begin is these are my opinions uh, based on my experiences and my preferences. So uh, oftentimes with photography, if you ask five photographers the same question, you might get six or seven different answers. So uh, you've been warned. Um, anyway, so we'll get started here. We're going to review the topics, then we'll dive right into them, uh, begin the answers, and um, hopefully some knowledge will be shared. So. Are you ready? Are you sitting down? Are you comfy? Are you good to go? Here we go. So the topics will be uh, tips and techniques, editing software. I feel like I'm on Jeopardy announcing categories. Uh, phone photography, uh, camera stuff and gear, photography business, the business side of things, portraits, style and visual voice, and lastly, miscellaneous things didn't quite fit anywhere else so let's start with tips and techniques. <clears throat> easy for me to say tips and techniques um first question uh is about taking photos of the moon uh settings wise why is it black how blah 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 blah, blah. and the second question related to this is do you need a special lens so fortunately last night uh we had uh a good shot of the moon so I, I i took a photo of that so let's hop over to lightroom and take a look at that so this is the photo i uh, created last night of the moon uh, the crescent moon happening uh over where i live in sammamish washington it's got some red to it because we're getting uh smoke from the fires in british columbia um, so the air is a little chewy these days so the question about settings here's the thing when you're creating a photo of the moon, um, you pretty much cannot rely on the camera's exposure meter to accurately expose the moon because it's difficult. Most exposure settings, uh, exposure systems will look at the whole scene and average things out. So the moon's gonna be super bright, the sky's gonna be very dark, so you're just gonna get a white blob usually if you're in manual, I mean automatic exposure. So I go to manual exposure, and if you come over here to the histogram uh, and this part of Lightroom, you will see uh, my settings. ISO was 400, um, my uh, aperture was F11, so fairly close because I wanted it good and sharp, and my shutter speed was 1 15th of a second. So, uh, and I'm on a tripod too, so that's the other thing, on a tripod. Uh, last part of this question was about the lens. So the lens that was used to create this photo was this lens. It's a 300 millimeter uh, zoom lens. So it zooms out to 300 millimeters. Uh, and then I added another piece of gear called a teleconverter. This is a two times. So now this 300 becomes a 600 millimeter lens. So that looks like, you will see this uh, shown in, uh, in Lightroom here. It says 600 millimeters for the focal length plus plus this is cropped so here's the cropped view uh probably cut out about 25 percent 20 25 percent of the photo so it's actually zooming in a little more so we're maybe closer to seven eight hundred millimeters uh effectively um but that's what it takes yes it takes 
manual exposure. Um, you, the moon is can be very bright, so you may not need as much light as you think. Uh, but uh, if you want a good sharp photo, you have to make your aperture smaller, and that means you don't get a lot of light that way, so you're going to need more time of light, and you want to keep your ISO low so you don't get noise in the photo in the sky, the blank sky there. So um, that means probably a tripod. So telephoto lens, tripod, manual exposure. Moon photos, there you go. Uh, how can we create an interesting photo uh, about landscape without interesting lighting and very interesting subjects? Uh, and then the compos one of the things I suggest in class often when you're trying to create interesting compositions is a quick way to do that is to get closer to your subject. And a lot of times in landscapes, the big scenes, you can't do that or you can't do it conveniently. Um, and then what is your advice for taking photos of landscapes such as mountains, waters, forests, etc.? So the main thing I would suggest with landscape photos is repetition. You have to go back. Uh, light is such an important component of landscape photography. Um, and oftentimes you want to be there at sunrise or sunset, depending on which way your landscape is in relation to the light. Uh, or you want to be there uh, in conditions, other atmospheric conditions like fog or, or certain kinds of rain or snow where it's different than the normal. That's how you create interest is you do something beyond the normal, different than the normal. So that creates uniqueness, rareness, and interest. Um, so thinking about that, you probably have to come back multiple times. Now, having said that, if you can't do that, you, you, this is the one and only time you're going to be there. And that happened uh, recently for us. We went to Utah and created some photos uh, while we were down there visiting my wife's parents. And um, we were only going to be there this one part for one time. So we went at sunset and we had great light. So that helped a ton. Uh, not amazing sky. We didn't get really dramatic clouds, but uh, it was still really beautiful because the landscape was so beautiful. So come back, um, watch for the light. You may have to go back multiple times. And if, if again, if it's not amazing the time you go there, still create a photo because it's still beautiful. It's still a postcard type photo, the photo that maybe everybody else already has. If you're only gonna go there once, that's the photo to get. All right, next. I find it hard to take photos and make interesting photos on the spot without going anywhere. Uh, I need. This person needs excitement. They need to be inspired uh, and to make interesting photos. Uh, and when feeling pressured, like when you have a photography assignment, uh, it makes it even harder for this person. So how do you deal with those challenges to succeed in taking interesting photos? So that's a great question. There's a bunch of little questions wrapped up in here. And here's what I would say. First, uh, inspiration that, you know, oh, I want to go create photos. I want to make something. Um, comes from the act of making the thing. If you wait for inspiration, if you wait for that special moment, uh, it likely won't happen. It's in the process of getting up, taking the lens cap off, going outside with your camera, and looking at things that the inspiration will potentially have the most likelihood of coming. So it's inspiration comes through the act of creation. It's not a separate thing. It doesn't happen before. It happens during. Second, so it's a mindset thing. It's getting off the couch. I have the hardest time doing that. So it's getting off the couch, doing that is the first step to finding inspiration and then picking up the device you're going to create with. Um, the second part of this question is feeling pressure and all that. And I get that. That's that's different. It's not your choice. Um, and just be gracious to yourself in that moment. Uh, know that you may not be doing your best work, but you're doing the work that you need to do. And there's still lessons to be learned. There's still uh, things that you might discover about yourself or the types of photos you like to create. So, so take advantage of that still. Again, mindset, okay, I'm, I'm not feeling like it, but I got to get it done because I have this deadline. Um, that's just reality sometimes. And amazing things and surprises might happen if you're open to them in those moments. Um, uh, second question in here, how do you find good photo spots? Do you just drive, walk around randomly, or do you have a process for finding a good spot or scene? Um, 
I am a lazy photographer. Um, I'm a lazy photographer. So um, I like being able to make photos and create images almost anywhere I go. Uh, I'll look. I'll get look at small things. I'll look at details. I'll look at textures, abstracts, light, shadow. Um, so that's me. But if you're looking for a more typical type photo scene, then yeah, pay attention as you're out and about. If you're even going to the grocery store, look for little vignettes or little moments of places that this might be a good scene where I could create some photos. And then write a note to yourself on your phone. Uh, create a note file that you can have of locations. Um, go out at sunrise and sun, well, sunrise is hard for most people. I'm, I'm not a more, well, I'm not an early, early morning person. Uh, but maybe at sunset, drive around and see how the light is behaving uh, near you or walk around if you don't have a car and see if there's places that the sun is doing something interesting. Uh, think about places that might get different kinds of weather, different fog or, or again, snow and how they might be transformed and, and make that list. So it, when you're out, be observant of places that might create interesting photo opportunities. If I run out of ideas for subjects from looking around my home and other locations, what can I do to stir up some more ideas? Um, this is pretty common with students, um, especially this past year and a half with uh, with COVID and, and somewhat lockdown where, not lockdown, but limited uh, ability to get out and about. Um, so yeah, looking around the space you always are in is hard to find some photos. So take a walk. That's the best advice is, is take a walk. It's good for your body. It's good for your mind. Uh, and it'll be good for creativity. And, and while you're out creating, then the inspiration thing will happen. So maybe take a walk in your neighborhood or um, take, a, take a bus or a car and go somewhere where you don't normally go that you still might find interesting. Find a park. Um, around here in the Seattle area, there's lots of botanical gardens. So flowers and uh, relatively... Uh, just by themselves, interesting subjects for photography that you can find pretty easily. Um, so yeah, just just use your feet. Uh, I say that's one of the most uh, often underused tools in our photography is our feet uh, and taking a walk and going to uh, explore just even your immediate vicinity, you might find some things that would surprise you as photo subjects. Alrighty, next question. Next question is, do you have any advice for taking photos in the rain? Um, be careful. That would be my first advice. Um, when you're in the rain, water and electronics often don't mix. Uh, lots of phones are at least semi weather resistant slash waterproof. Uh, so you're probably okay with a phone, recent phones especially. Um, some cameras are more weather resistant than others. Uh, I wouldn't put a garden hose on it or get it soaked, soaked. But um, some of the more middle to high end cameras are, are weather resistant. Uh, a low tech and low budget solution uh, for your phone. If you're a little unsure, you know, just open this up, put your phone in it, uh, at least cover most of it. And you can still use the, uh, the volume button as a shutter click. Um, it's not ideal and it, yeah, you got to experiment with that a little bit. So there you go. Try apply a tra um, Ziploc bag of some kind or get one of the bigger ones. Um, there are protective waterproof cases available for just about all kinds of cameras and phones. They tend to be really, really expensive. Uh, so be careful uh, when it's wet. Uh, and uh, if, when, if, you're, if your camera does get wet, dry it off as soon as you can. All right, moving on to editing software. Editing software. Uh, first question, why do I need to be careful about when editing a photo in black and white? Also, do you have any photos, tips on how to make interesting black and white photos? Very good question. Let's head over to Lightroom. All right, so let's take a look at some black and white photos and what makes black and white photos work. Um, in short, the most successful, most dramatic, most interesting black and white photos have lots of contrast. They are have a lot of good dark blacks, a lot of good bright whites, and tones in betweens. Um, the best black and white photos uh, don't that can, photos that convert best to black and white don't rely on the color to tell the story. It's usually about shapes and textures and lines and 
shadows and highlights. So uh, these are some photos from London. Um, and you can see that uh, this is all about shapes and lines. Uh, here is what it looks like in color. Give it a second. There we go. There's the color version. Uh, it's just some tans, uh, some, some earth tone color. So don't really need the color for the story. So when editing black and white photos, um, what you want to do is, is pay attention to the highlights and the whites and the colors uh, as you convert them to black and white. You can make certain colors um, brighter and darker, and that'll um, change the appearance of the black and white image. So uh, how do you do that? It's just an eyeball thing. It depends. Uh, it's personal preference. It's uh, what you like. It's what the image needs uh, to look its best. But uh, black and white starts with good contrast, starts with uh, lines and shapes and textures. Um, and the advantage of going black and white is you create an image that is potentially timeless. We tend to associate colors with certain time periods, certain um, certain um, styles, certain uh, eras. So black and white tends to be timeless. So that's an advantage. Alrighty, next question about editing software. What do we got? Is it more efficient to use Lightroom than Photoshop when editing photos? Uh, I think the answer is yes. Um, it, it does depend a little bit uh, if you need to um, replace something uh, major in a photo, then Photoshop's the way to go. If you don't need to do major pixel surgery, then Lightroom's the way to go. I can edit much more quickly in uh, Lightroom, uh, the, the, the types of edits I do in photos, which are around color and light, uh, exposure, maybe some slight uh, image fixes with uh, the uh, spot removal brush uh, and cropping. I can do that faster in Lightroom. So that's my opinion. Your mileage may vary. And then uh, last question, I believe it is here in the uh, Lightroom and editing software section is, should I edit, uh, should I watermark my photographs whenever I post them on social media? Uh, my answer, I, I don't personally. Um, I think oftentimes watermarks are, are they're just a big splash of your name across the middle of the photo and then you can't see the photo. Um, or if you make it more subtle, it's usually in a corner. And, and if someone wants to steal your photo, they're gonna steal your photo. And if they have any um, experience with software at all, they will either be able to crop your watermark out if it's in the corner or uh, do some kind of healing brush or Lightroom uh, Photoshop magic to uh, make it disappear. So it's not a guarantee. Uh, it does give you a little layer of, if they do remove it, you have then that's willful copyright infringement. If you have a, a court case type of thing, but that's a whole nother ball of wax of, um, of um, requirements of things you have to do to even get to court. So I'm not gonna cover that here. <laughs> copyright law is complicated. Um, I don't, uh, if I do watermark, uh, in the end, what I'll do is I'll just put my web address. So it's easy for someone to go find where the source was, which is me. So I just use www.mywebaddress.com and it's usually small and in a corner the once or twice a year I do that. And you can do that in Lightroom when you export. You can tell it to put it in one of the corners or wherever you'd like. You can use an image for a watermark. You can use text. Easy to do in Lightroom. All right, moving on. We're moving on to phone photography, phone photography. So the first question here, a good way to get the best possible photo of the moon on your phone. What's the answer class? What's the answer? I'll show you the answer. Give me a second. All right, so the question is, what's the best way to take a photo of the moon with your phone? I will share my favorite answer for that question. The best way to do that with your phone. Are you ready? Here we go. <laughs> okay, I'm being a little sarcastic here. Um, the downside to using your phone to create photos of the moon is, remember that photo was taken with a 600 millimeter lens. This is about a 50 millimeter lens if you have the 2X going, the two time mode. So you don't have the reach. Plus, um, 
if you leave it in auto exposure, you're just going to get a white blob. So you would need to do some kind of exposure override to make the scene overall darker so you can see have any chance of seeing the detail in the moon. Plus, lastly, uh, phones are not very sensitive in low light, and usually the moon is out when it's dark and, or most visible and most dramatic. So you're going to get uh, a lot of noise, a lot of image quality loss with your phone. So basically, there's no good way that I'm aware of to take a photo of the moon with your phone. It's it's the technical limits of the phone, both the lens and the, the sensor uh, just get in the way. I mean, they don't have the technical capabilities of a camera, but your camera can't play Candy Crush. So there you go. Or do TikTok. All right, next phone question. Sometimes taking photos with my phone, the subject does not seem far away with my eye, but the camera can't quite seem to pick it up. And when I zoom in, it pixelates poorly. Is there a workaround for this? Or do I need to buy a zoom lens for my phone? So here's uh, what's going on with phone stuff again. Phone lenses... Uh, if you have only one lens on your phone, uh, the phone I have has two lenses, and some of them now have three or more. Uh, each lens is a different focal length, so the standard lens is usually uh, a relatively wide-angle lens, which means everything looks a little farther away. It's wider than your normal field of view. So um, that's why things look a little farther away when, than what you're doing when you're looking at it like this. Uh, and then the next thing that happens is if you're creating a photo with your phone and you do the pinch to zoom to zoom into things, that's a digital zoom. And all you're doing is making the pixels, which are the dots that make up the image, larger. Uh, think of them like uh, Lego blocks. Instead of using one of the little tiny ones, now you're using one of the big ones that you really can see. So digital zoom, don't do it on your phone. Uh, you can get a little bit of a zoom effect by cropping in software after you create the photo, uh, but you can only get probably about 25% enlargement before, again, you start seeing image quality loss. Uh, regarding zoom lenses for phones, I'm not, uh, I don't have any experience with that. Uh, I know there are several companies that do make some, so that might be worth checking out. Uh, however, having said that, once you know, if you put a zoom lens on a phone, it's going to be you know, something that sticks out like this. I mean, I know it's not this, but they're often like this. And therefore, now your phone is not tiny and portable. You certainly can't put it in your pocket anymore. So something to be aware of with uh, add-ons to phones. Uh, it takes away from the primary function of the phone, and I don't know that that's helpful. Plus, they're probably, for good ones, they're probably expensive, and then you might as well get a camera. In my opinion, one man's opinion. Um, all right, we're going back. Here's what's another way to get focus on a specific subject so that it's not super blurry, especially on Androids. Uh, so first, to answer the focus question uh, with your phone, let me go back to here. Most, of, most cameras on phones, you can focus by tapping the screen and wherever you tap is where it will focus. So try that first. Uh, then the second part of the question is uh, blurriness, and blurriness often comes from, again, the limitations of a phone. Phones have small sensors which aren't super sensitive to light. They need lots of light to take sharp photos because when it gets darker and they, they're, what they're going to do to get more light is use longer duration shutter speed, which means they're more susceptible to any little movement, which looks like you're doing this when you're creating the photo. So I know it doesn't, you're not, you don't look like this when you're taking the photo, but the photo looks like you were doing that. So uh, again, it's some limitations of the phone, but as far as the focus part, uh, try tapping the screen where you want it to focus and it should focus there. Next up, uh, how can I make phone photos at night have different moods? I found most of my time my photos especially with phone, look fairly similar, end up sharing the same feeling when looking at them. All right, so night, night. Uh, I think we tend to think of night as being just one time after the sun goes down and before it comes up. And there's, there's lots of variations in the night. So uh, before sunset, you have golden hour. So you got a different kind of light, which would give you a different kind of mood with any camera. Uh, then you get into sunset, which is you know, got its own color of light. And then after sunset, you have blue hour, 
which is like it says very blue and then you get into darkness and uh, where you get more dramatic shadows from any any little light will be more dramatic um, and stand out so watch for the gradations the different light scenes if you will that happen between before sunset and then during and after sunset uh, try that uh, also on the flip side you know if you're up early 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 in the morning uh, sunrise does the same thing before sunrise you have blue hour then you get sunrise and you get um, the golden hour right after sunrise and um, there you go so watch for those gradations watch for light watch for shadow uh, look for the drama there in light and shadow darkness contrast uh, look for that that'll help you with more moods now it means you may not be taking portraits of your friend or what you're eating uh, you might be taking pictures of a um, of a sign on a building that's glowing compared to everything around it or something so different subjects possibly too all right next question uh, also kind of a low light question around phones uh, how about image quality and low light whenever I it's again it's the blurry issue with phones when you don't use a flash so let's back up a little bit to this camera angle and discuss the, again we're dealing with the technical limits of the can the current camera technology and phones uh, we're limited by the size of the sensor which is very small uh, which can't soak up as much light as the sensors in cameras like this uh, so they what they tend to do to get more light is use longer duration of shutter speed which again uh, makes it prone to blurriness some of the more recent cameras have something called night shot or night mode where they will do a longer exposure a couple of them and then with math and computational photography inside the camera inside the phone will get rid of the blur and do all sorts of magic so I don't have a phone that does that I hope to get one soon when the next generation comes out um, but that would be look for the night mode thing and see if that helps and it doesn't use the flash the reason also the flash is poor on these photo uh, phones is because it's a very small light source so this little tiny light uh, will tend to make shadows that are very hard. So they will have a hard edge. The lights that I have in this room that are lighting my face are very large. It's, it's a 24 inch over here on this side. It's 18 inches over here on this side. So there's a like a four millimeter light. So it's very tiny, quarter inch at best. So that's the limitation of this kind of light. And also it does, it's not very powerful, it doesn't go very far. So that's often why that's what you're you're dealing with. It's you're dealing with physics. You've got this little slim package, not a lot of space and physics. So there's ways around it and there's ways to be creative with it. If you have a blurry photo and you and you're maybe some interesting shapes, go ahead and make it more blurry. Shake the phone while you're creating the photo. See if that makes something interesting. Maybe you get some cool light streaks. Uh, or interesting textures and patterns it's fun to play around with uh, and it doesn't really cost you anything so see what happens embrace the blur sometimes embrace the blur all right next up we're on to camera gear and stuff camera gear and stuff or camera stuff and gear it's kind of the same thing all right first question about this on my canon eos t3 when i push the shutter button the red dot will flash on what the focal point is Seems to be default to the center What when doing rule of thirds, which is a recent photo assignment, uh, where you move the main subject out of the middle to one of the thirds, uh, left, right, top, bottom, uh, having difficulty getting focus. So on this, I, I have a, a Canon T, EOS uh, T5, the Rebel T5i here, which is from Highline. Um, and here's how you do this. And basically, here's what I did. I Googled um how uh, i googled uh eos rebel t3 focal point selector so you've got to know the vocabulary of what to look for so here's what you're going to do right here this little kind of crosshair looking thing it's a little square uh there's a button right below it you push that button and it brings up the focus point selector and there are let's see how many dots we got oops uh, focus point selector we, I think there's nine of them here. There's nine dots, yes. So you have nine points that you could select. And by default, it's set to auto, which means it'll do 
it'll select what it thinks is best, which is off in the middle. To move it off of there, what you have to do is you use the little pad over here around the set button. You can move it up or down or left. So you can just go around, around, around. And I think, if, yeah, if you pick the middle, uh, it'll go to the middle one. Now, here's the thing. So downsides to this system is it doesn't, you're not looking through the viewfinder to know, okay, which way am I focusing? Uh, where is the, the location of what I want in focus? So uh, it's a little clunky system. It works. The other thing that's a little clunky with this is uh, it'll stay there until you reset it. So that focus point is going to be on the right, and then maybe the next photo you want on the left, so you have to come back out and move it around again. Uh, as opposed to a camera like mine, some of the more uh, recent cameras, let's go over here, let's go here, uh, where I can move this around while I'm previewing the photo and see where my focus point is very, very easily. It's that green uh, dot, that green square is my focus point. I can even change the size of the focus point, make it larger or smaller and move it all around the screen. So uh, especially modern mirrorless cameras will let you do this, move it farther away from the center and uh, easily select it uh, while you are creating the photo. A lot of ca cameras nowadays have an auto function. I think all of them do, uh, where the computer adjusts the exposure. What do I think about using this function? I think it's a great idea. Uh, I think the hard part of creating a photo is not the exposure, is not how much light is in the image. The hard part, the creative part of creating the photo is what you pointed at and where you put the camera how you put the camera in relation to the subject, how the subject is in relation to everything else in the frame, uh, in relation to the frame itself of the camera. That's the hard part. And if you're concentrating on the exposure stuff when you first get started, uh, I think it can be difficult to also pay attention to creating an interesting photo in the box of the camera. So I started, when I started, I started on the uh, P mode. So uh, back to overhead here. So um, the P mode. So it's this mode here on most exposure. Uh, this is called the exposure mode dial. It's P. Uh, Canon does T and TV, which is time value, shutter priority, AV, aperture priority, M for manual. Um, uh, other systems use S here and A. So it's called the PSAM dial. Um, if you do nothing else, take it off the green auto mode the A there, and move to P. You can tell your friends it stands for photographer mode. It stands for program. Uh, I used to use that all the time. When I first started uh, getting serious about photography again, I would start there because uh, then I could concentrate on comp composition and I could change exposure a little bit if I needed to with exposure compensation, which is a quick way to add or take away a little bit of light from your photo. Uh, without doing any math and knowing which way aperture goes and shutter speed and all that stuff, which can get complicated. So uh, at least start with the P mode. It's a good place to be. Um, again, as I mentioned, that's how I created photos for the longest time. That's how my wife still creates photos. Uh, she's in uh, the program mode. So nothing wrong with it. Everybody has different preferences. Uh, what are your thoughts on splurging on photography gear? <laughs> Is it really worth it? Also, where are your go -to, what are your go-to gear when taking pictures? So, um, <laughs> is it worth it? I don't know if you can see all this stuff back here, but there's a that's all photo gear and all in front of me. But uh, yes, I like gear. Uh, I have there's a thing called GAS gear acquisition syndrome, uh, gas. So a lot of photographers have gas. Uh, the gear is important and it matters and it. it if, but it's also fun to make work what you already have. Uh, I had a former student, all she had when she was started her wedding photography business with one lens. She had a 50 millimeter and she made it work. Uh, she figured out how to do everything she needed to do with that one lens. And that was it. And it worked for her. She created amazing photos. So um, around splurging, spending money on gear, yeah, it's fun, if, especially if you, can, if you can afford it. And if photography is a priority, and if what you have is getting in the way of what you want to do next, if you're missing something, like if you want to be the moon photographer, you're going to need a telephoto lens. 
if you want to be a, a, a close-up macro, I mean, close-up photographer, you're going to need macro lenses. So there are certain things you're going to need along the way if you want to get specialized. Most of the time, you can make do with what you probably already have. So if you can afford it, then yes. But if you, uh, I recommend not, you know, doing it on the credit card, not going into debt as all possible, because uh, that's expensive money. Uh, what is my go-to gear? Uh, my go-to favorite piece of gear, the best value thing I've ever bought for my photography is this. And I have a whole video about this. This is called an extension tube. I will put a link to it. Oh, it goes up here. The link goes up here. I'll put a link to the extension tube video up here. Uh, these are about $80. And what they do is they go between the lens and my camera. So this, the tubes go on my camera body. And then my lens goes on the tubes. And now any lens I put on here can focus closer. Uh, you have to experiment a little bit to see which um, lenses work best. Um, for me, I found my 18 to 135 at 135 millimeters lets me get like two to four inches away from most subjects and I can create really close up photos for relatively inexpensive. And I like those because it's an easy way to eliminate distractions, create interesting photos without spending a lot of money. Uh, if I were to buy a camera, what type of camera do you think would be the best to buy? Also, are there there are many companies. Which company do you think sells the best cameras? Um, this one is definitely an it depends answer. Uh, also, uh, in relation to which is the best, I mean, that's really personal preference. Um, I am a Fujifilm user. I really like their ergonomics uh, and their philosophy and their the image quality. If you go buy a new camera today, anywhere from the entry level five, six hundred dollar cameras to the six thousand dollar cameras, anything in between, they're all going to create high quality photos and they're all going to be reliable. It's a matter of it's kind of like picking a car. Um, when you choose a car, you're making some choices based on your personal preference, your budget and your specific needs. So. Cameras are like that. I would suggest if at all possible when you're shopping for a camera, go to a local camera store and uh, one that specializes in camera, not the Best Buys and Targets and Fred Meyers, which are, they have cameras, but very limited and not generally, in my experience, people know a lot about cameras. Because what will happen when you go to a camera store and talk to someone, they're basically interviewing you. They're, they're going to ask you lots of questions about what you're going to do with it, what kind of photos you want to make now and what are you thinking of doing in the future so you can best find a good fit that you won't grow out of too quickly. Uh, in the, the Seattle area, there are two stores I'm familiar with. Uh, one is Kenmore Camera up in Bothell, Washington, and the second one is Glazer's Camera in Seattle. So uh, go visit a local camera store. Uh, and then buy from them. Uh, it's, it's just good and you can walk out of the store with it right away. You don't have to wait for the delivery truck to come to your porch, your front door, whatever. So yeah, go to a camera store. Uh, all the cameras are good right now. Uh, no bad ones, just like there's really no bad cars anymore even. So that's what I think. Alrighty, moving on to photography career and business. So uh, what does it take to be a photographer and make some money at it? And how does that work? What's it all about? So let's get into a few questions. How much dedication do you need to put into a photography career? Uh, it depends. Um, if you want to do it full time, that's very dedicated. If you want to uh, see how it goes, see how you enjoy it, see what success you have, see how it feels when you add money to the equation, which changes everything, then um, maybe you could just do it part time and not dedicate your life to it. Um, so you got to you got to balance things with your 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 financial realities. Uh, the timing of where things are in your life, uh, your 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 um, preferences in creating images, and who might pay you for those. So, uh, as far as dedication, um, it's pretty important. You want to always be um, striving to create quality and whatever you're making available to potentially sell. So that's super important. But dedication specifically to okay, I'm going to live, eat, and breathe, sleep photography. Uh, not so much, in my opinion, um, if you're not doing it full time. If you're doing it full time, then yeah, you got to live, eat, breathe, and sleep it. So 
And even if you're doing photography full time, you're not doing photography full time. Um, you're maybe doing it 20% of the time, more likely 10% of the time. The rest of the time is marketing and emails and communication and editing and financial stuff. And yeah, so there you go. Next question, what has helped build your photography business? What kind of marketing has helped you build a consistent clientele? And the answer to that is I'm not there yet. Uh, uh, that's part of the, honestly, part of the reason I teach at Highline is uh, I don't have enough photography business to support full time. A uh, variety of factors into that, um, partially is a dedication issue, uh, but partially is a preference of type of images I wanna make. The type of images I wanna make that I enjoy the most would be stuff you might put on your wall and it's not stuff that everybody wants to put on their wall. So uh, having said that, uh, what has helped me build my business though is um, the business I do have is, is kind of simple marketing, it's, it's, it's opportunity. Uh, the best example I have of this is one day I was out walking uh, my son's dog here in our condo, just walking right outside this window and walking down the way and came upon a pink school bus that was being painted with roses. And the, the lady who was painting it, we started a conversation because you start a conversation with people when they're painting a bus with flowers. And uh, so she found out she's an artist. Uh, we got to chatting, her name's Carrie Schmidt. She's really cool and fun. And uh, she asked what I do. I said, I'm a photographer. She says, oh, I need some photos of the bus and me. And so like a week later, I was taking photos of her and the bus and we've been working together a couple times a year is in, since, since then, which is three or four years ago. So just telling people what you do tell friends and family uh fire up the bat signal on facebook on instagram let everybody know that you're a photographer uh next question is what is my favorite aspect about photography what's been the most challenging thing about photography in the photography business so the favorite aspect of photography is is some of the is the people i've met um i've met some awesome people and gotten to intersect them especially when i do wedding photos uh, at that fun and life-changing moment in their life. And that's a privilege and it's it's just so fun to experience. Um, the challenging stuff is getting it to be a business, getting the word out there um, and just being aware. I'm, I'm not the typical photographer. I'm older than most. And a lot of wedding photographers are female and I'm not. So there's that. All right, what's the next question? Uh, do you charge per hour or for the session as a whole? Uh, I do charge by the session, which is the way I get to my session price is an approximate number of hours I think it's gonna take, which the client, I don't tell them that. Uh, and then I multiply by what I need uh, per hour to then make that. Um, th there's worksheets out there that you can calculate what your hourly uh, needs to be if you were charging hourly. Um, to, to make a living. And the, it's surprising how much you need to charge. Uh, if you live in anywhere near the Seattle area and you're working for yourself, especially if you're doing it full time, it starts at about a hundred bucks an hour. Um, so a half a day gig is $400 or more, um, which sounds like a lot of money, but when you're pricing your, the best photography pricing advice I've ever heard is you are not pricing your photography for you. You probably can't afford you. Uh, you need to price for the market, for your clients, not for you. So it's probably a bigger number than you think. Um, dun, dun, dun. Next one. Uh, a wedding event uh, or other events, how do you know what to charge for that? Um, this is true of any kind of pricing. If you're doing portraits, uh, I call them, uh, what do I call them? Profile photos instead of headshots. Our language in photography is very violent, so I try not headshots. It's like in a video game, uh, shooting photos. I say creating photos, um, taking photos, capturing. I say creating. Anyway, wedding or other events or the, the categories of photography. The way I price myself is uh, um, based on partially what I need to live. Uh, since it's not a full-time gig, I can be a little bit less expensive than some others. Uh, I'll do some research. I'll go out there and let's say on wedding photography, I'll do 
I'll do a search for wedding photographers in Sammamish or um, let's say uh, Kirkland or other places and see what comes up. And most wedding uh, photographers will list their prices and then I'll try to be about in the middle. Um, I'll find what the lowest one is, what the highest one is, and I'll try and be right around the middle in a happy price I can live with. So um, that's true of portraits, uh, the headshots and so on and so forth. So finding the price that you can live with that's uh, not too high, not too low. Uh, when you price your stuff, don't be at the bottom because there's always going to be someone who will do it for less than you. There's always be someone who will do it for free plus wash your car. So <laughs> there's always someone cheaper. Don't fight that battle, in my opinion. Uh, next question, is photography business worth opening? Good one. Will you see stable pay and clients? I know that camera and stuff is expensive. Uh, you have to invest some money, but is there a guarantee that you will make profit from the money already invested? And the big answer to this, it depends. It really, really depends. Uh, running your own business isn't for everybody. Uh, making money for yourself isn't for everybody. Uh, one of the hardest things for most, anybody who opens their own business, is the cash flow. So one month you might make $5,000 or $1,000, more than you've ever made before. And you're like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. And the next two months you make nothing. Or you get you had a gig scheduled and you did the session, but you haven't been paid yet. So it's the timing of the cash when the cash actually gets to your bank and the amount. It takes at least for most people two years for that to kind of even out and not be so much woo and woo. Uh, so... Be aware of that. That's really one of the hard things. Another thing is, especially when you're in a creative endeavor, something that comes from you, and you start attaching money to it and the need to make money at it, uh, a lot of people, then they lose their love for it. And then it shows up in the work and what they're creating. So you have to ask yourself that question. You know, if, if I worked at the ice cream store, would I still want to eat ice cream? I probably would, but, you know, hey, I'm that guy. Um, so if you're being paid for photography, do you still want to do photography? That's, you know, something to think about. There's no guarantees for success. I've been, you know, doing photography off and on full time to half time to less than half time for 14 years. Um, and I've never made enough at photography by itself to live on. There you go. Uh, I currently, I, I just created a chart. I think I have six or seven income streams connected to photography uh, that are all of that. You've got to be diversified. Oh, it's just, it's complicated. It's awesome. And there's neat that you can have all these opportunities, but there are no guarantees. It's not for everybody. But on the other hand, it doesn't hurt to give it a try. The startup costs are pretty minimal. If you have a camera, you, all you need is a business license, which is easy to do uh, through Washington State Department of Licensing in Washington State, obviously. And uh, just look, just Google your state's and business licensing process, and uh, it's usually somewhere between twenty-five and a hundred bucks. Then you're legal. The other tricky thing with self-employed of any kind is uh, how taxes work. Like when you receive a check from someone else, a paycheck. Uh, they're paying uh, half of your social security taxes and uh, insurance often and stuff. So that's why you have to make a lot as a self-employed person per hour or per gig because you're covering expenses that oftentimes used to be covered by your employer, especially insurance. Yikes, it's expensive. Another reason, I'm very glad to be at Highline College. All right, what's the next question? Uh, the next question is about stock photo companies. Uh, like Shutterstock or Adobe Stock or there's a couple other ones. Is it worth your time? <laughs> Here's, uh, I'll show you. I'll show you. All right. So uh, here is my, uh, where I currently am at uh, Adobe Stock. So I have a few photos there, not a ton. Uh, and I need to put some more on there. I haven't, I haven't put the energy into this. Uh, I just selected some photos I thought would be kind of generic enough for people uh, to potentially use in different places. Uh, I have a grand total of, and I've had these photos there for three, four, five years, $15.70 in earnings. Um, Adobe and many of the companies now have, and by the way, uh, you don't get paid until you've got $100 sitting in your account over here. So 
I've made nothing. <laughs> so most of these companies now have uh, subscriptions and you get just like musicians, a very, very small cent, a percentage when someone actually buys your photo when they buy it on the subscription. I get like 10 cents a photo, 25 cents a photo. Uh, it, the most I think I've ever made on a single photo uh, was like two or three bucks. So is it worth it? It can be because it's money that's out. I mean, it's photos that may not be doing anything else for you. And uh, but it does. There's time and effort and keywording and there's a whole art and science in being successful at stock photography. Uh, so if you've got an extra five, 10 hours a week to dedicate to that, go for it um, and see how it goes. And then you can come and advise me on how to be successful at it because I'm not having great success. All right. How do you publish photos so that they will be seen by the most amount of people? Um, again, I don't have the answer to this by a long shot. Um, getting your stuff out there is the trickiest part of the game. Not a, it's not a game, but uh, the whole thing. Uh, if you're on Instagram, uh, you're fighting the algorithm uh, and you're fighting people's attention and just the overwhelming amount of stuff out there for photos. Um, there are other places to be, but um, frankly, for most of us, it's not really about ooh, the most amount of people. Uh, you can have success as a photographer uh, without having uh, a million people know who you are. You can have success maybe with a thousand people or a hundred people uh, who are who are who know who you are and will repeat business with you and uh, either buy photos to put on their wall or have you take family photos or any kind of mix that you have in different kinds of business. So. Uh, it's not just about numbers, but uh, numbers are one way to do it, uh, having lots of people see your stuff. All right, going from creating for yourself uh, to shooting events such as wedding, do you get the same satisfaction or does it mainly stay as a way of income, like a necessity? And my initial reaction is, is yeah, it does. It's uh, If in Michael's perfect world, <laughs> I would just create what I want to create and the universe would be uh, so happy I created it that people would just be throwing money at me so that I could do what I enjoy and they would have something they would enjoy. Uh, but that's not reality. Uh, and, and I'm glad for it because I wouldn't have met some of the people I've met uh, and some of the people I get to help along the way. Right now I have um, one of my income streams is one-on-one -on -one online uh, photography training and I've met some really cool people help them move to the next level of what they're learning and that's been awesome that's such a treat uh, just like it is a treat to teach uh, students at Highline and get to meet them when I'm in the classroom with them and or when they come by office hours and if you haven't come by zoom office hours art 147 students you got a week to do it so come on by um, but yeah when you throw them when you add the money into it um, it does change things when you add for me as an introvert, oh, I got to go be with people and I got to talk to them. And I got to understand their personality. I got to I got to be present in a different way. Yeah, it's it's hard work for me, uh, but I do enjoy it. So, yeah. Both and and it depends <laughs> is the answer to that question. All right, uh, we're going back here now. We're going to go to portraits. I think there's just one question here, and that question is the posing question. How do you get people to pose or not feel uncomfortable when posing for pictures? Um, so here's my experience with that is uh, a couple things I've noticed lately. One, uh, especially if someone's under 25, they tend to kind of know how to stand in front of a camera. They, Especially ladies tend to uh, know what to do with their arms and their legs and their hips and their feet. Uh, when they're standing and just even when they're sitting, they just tend to know. And even the guys kind of tend to know. They're aware of their body and how to present themselves. Um, so that helps. Second thing regarding posing is the way to have people who aren't comfortable posing feel comfortable posing is two things. Well, I guess it's just one thing. Don't, don't have them pose. Just have them be. Um, just maybe give them slight directions but uh, have them be more casual, have them do their daily thing, um, have it be more candid than a standard pose, stand in front of here and turn your head this way kind of thing. Um, that's one kind of photo and that's there's a value in that, there's a place for that. But if you're trying to capture who someone is, if you're trying to distill in this little box we have with our cameras, 
who that person is, that's probably not it. It's, you know, if they're, if they're, if they play a music instrument, have them play the instrument. If they are creating, if they're a chef, have them be cooking. If they're a parent, have them be with their kids. You see what I'm saying? Get them engaged in something that they connect with, love, and then they will be comfortable automatically. And then you're just there to notice and uh, preserve those moments. So that would be my suggestion on portraits. I mean, yeah, you got to get the one standing in front of the wall and like this, but uh, get the fun ones too. Get the the more real life ones, the way they look the other 99% of the time. All right. Moving on to style and visual voice. Um, Some questions here. Uh, What is one style of photography that you're really interested in have been able to execute not been able to execute what do you like about that style um i like kind of minimalist stuff just abstract ordinary things that get transformed by the camera that's my favorite thing to do i've been able to do that pretty well i think the second kind of photos that i i want to take that i haven't been able to do is portraits i i uh, it's it's complicated it's it's self-esteem it's connecting with other people it's all that. Plus, um, I don't market myself as a portrait photographer, but I'm fascinated by people. So I would love to do what I just said in the previous question, get people doing their thing and create a bunch of photos of them uh, just doing what they love. So that's what I haven't been able to do. That's what I want to try and do more because people are fascinating and especially people enjoying what they're doing. Uh, we need to re- see more of that. How has my style evolved? What style do you usually go for? Do you still incorporate this now? Uh, My style has um, evolved from, I think, um, being kind of simplistic. It's it's still simple, but it's more complex in its simplicity. It's a little more sophisticated, I guess, I hope, uh, in that minimalism. I've gotten better at it. I refined it, and uh, I'm not done refining it. It's still a work in progress. I'll never be done learning. And yes, I still do it now. Uh, What is some advice to give someone wanting to learn more and continuing in photography? What do you wish you'd known starting off? Uh, The best advice I can give for anybody doing photography or any creative thing is just keep creating. Um, Find a way to do that every day. Find a way to integrate it into who you are as a person uh, and... um, the more you create, the, the better you'll get at it. The, uh, the deeper it will be integrated into who you are, the more natural it will be. The, in some ways, easier, but also be harder. It's complicated, but create. Just, just create. Um, what advice do I have that I wish I knew when I first started would be to understand how exposure works. Understand aperture, shutter speed, ISO, and how you control those to tell a big part of the story in your photo. Uh, I got lucky with my exposure more often than being good. Uh, Yeah, so I missed a lot of stuff because I didn't really understand how it worked. Uh, And then when I had to start teaching this class, got the opportunity to start teaching this class, that's when I really started to understand how all that stuff works, and I'm so glad for that. So understanding exposure, that's for me my answer. Hey, we're on to miscellaneous. Miscellaneous, how much value can be derived from opinions on a photo and how much must we rely on our own evaluation of it? That's a really good question. I like that. Um, I think other people's opinions of your photos can be helpful learning. Um, And it depends on what you want to do with your photos. If you are creating photos only for you, then no one else's opinion matters. But if you're creating photos in part to tell a story and hope people will understand or not necessarily understand, but connect to that and uh, somehow be impacted by it, maybe changed by it, then you need to know if it's doing that or not. And you need to understand what they're seeing versus what you meant for them to see. So it can be important. It can be very, very important. It's helpful. It can be hard to hear. Uh, I'm not good at receiving criticism and critique fragile ego and all that but um it's super helpful to know what people think um if you want to engage in helping your work impact people okay if you're creating just for you and the only place it's ever going to be is on your wall then opinions don't really matter of other people 
in my opinion. <laughs> All right, next. Uh, someone with experience, would you say it's always the best photos that are published and receive recognition? And uh, I think the answer to that is pretty obvious. No. Um, no, there's so many. I mean, there are so many amazing photos that, you know, don't get the literal or virtual thumbs up and likes. Um, and a lot of it, it's it's oh, it's complicated. Um, but the, that's not the reason I hope you're creating. Um, I, you ha I hope the reason for all of us to be creating to do this process is because it's a part of who we are. We feel like there's some value in what we have to say. And if it connects with one other person, has some impact with one other person, does a little change in the universe, that's enough. That's enough. That's a lot. So, again, attitude comes into play, thinking about, you know, we're, we're geared right now to numbers and thinking that we have to be at a certain threshold to be successful. And I, I, I resist that. I've always resisted that. Um, we can have impact in our corner of the world, the people right around us, and that is huge. Don't forget that. Concentrate on your part that you can control, which is the people around you, and then see what happens after that. Maybe there'll be ripples. All right, next uh, miscellaneous question. Are there any cheap film cameras that you can suggest to me? I want to take pictures with a film camera because I love the retro look, but I cannot afford the Fujifilm. Uh, so Fuji has a reputation for being a camera that has um, film, film simulations built into it so you can mimic different styles of film stock. Um, they started about $1,000 for Fuji cameras, um, which is not cheap, but it's what you paid for your phone, probably. So. Um, so the question is, can you cheap film cameras? They're all pretty inexpensive nowadays. Uh, you're gonna probably buy something used because no one's making them anymore. Um, you can probably find one at a camera store like the two I mentioned, um, uh, Kenmore Camera in Bothell, uh, Glazer's Camera in Seattle. Uh, you could probably find a used camera for film for, with a lens for about $100. Now with film cameras though, you're not done spending money. If you, every time you click, it's about a dollar or two because you have to buy the film, you have to have the film developed, and then you have to have uh, the film scanned uh, so that you can do something with it on your phone or other place. Now, having said all that, there's other ways to get that vintage kind of look, right? There's other ways. And it's maybe we need, need to do a little software kind of thing. All right, so let's do some vintage look with software. Um, there's ways, lots of ways to do this. What is a vintage look? Um, the things I think we tend to associate with old photos is the colors are a little different. They tend to be muted, less contrast. Uh, there tends to be noise in the image. There often is a color shift. Uh, so like with this photo, if I wanted to take it to a kind of vintage look, I would uh, turn down the vibrance and saturation. I would uh, turn down the contrast. Uh, I'd probably do something like this. And then I might start playing around with the colors a little bit and do something like... Um, that and what else maybe something like like that and then last but not least i might do something with um where is it ah oh, there it is the grain add some grain like it's got film grain in it uh from an old camera so something like that it's it's not quite vintage and you can experiment more with that but there's ways to do that in software there's presets that do that uh, so you can do it with your digital camera. There's no necessarily reason to buy film, although some people really enjoy the process of slowing down. You only got 24 photos, uh, and but then you really better understand how to do exposure because most of them aren't auto exposure. So uh, <laughs> do you ever fear weird walking around with the camera all the time? Uh, I tell students to always carry their camera. Um, the myth, uh, I, I don't always walk around with a camera. Um, I have it a lot, but not all the time. I sometimes feel awkward walking around in public with a camera. Um, here's the solution to that. No one's really looking at you. <laughs> um, seriously, most of the time people don't notice us. Uh, you know, they're busy with their own lives. They don't really notice you. I mean, if, you, if you've got a 
camera with a big lens on it, you start pointing it at people, yeah, they're going to notice you. But if you, uh, especially if you're using a phone or you don't have a really big lens on your camera, uh, you can be pretty inconspicuous. Uh, wear dark colors, that helps too. Um, but, and part of it is just being aware that, again, having an attitude of, okay, I'm never going to see this person again. They're never going to see me. I'm doing something I enjoy. I'm not harming anybody. I'm not bothering anybody. I'm just carrying my camera. Now, having said that, always be safe. Uh, be aware of your surroundings and whether you should be advertising you've got uh, potentially thousands of dollars on you uh, in gear. So just be aware of that. Um, yeah, but no one's watching. Sorry. Or if they are, they'll forget. So <laughs> there you go. Uh, how do you maximize natural light without much equipment and editing? Uh, and the answer to that is paying attention um, and being aware that now may not be the time for the photo. If, if I've tried moving around, trying getting in different camera positions and changing lenses and all sorts of things, and it's still not happening, the answer to when is, you know, how do I make this photo better may be come back another time. Come back when the light is doing something different, when there's different atmosphere. Maybe it needs fog. Maybe it needs rain. Maybe it needs rainbows. Um, just be aware of that maybe this answer, like I said, is to come back another time. Um, come back at sunrise or sunset or with frost on it or with raindrops on it. So, yeah, that's the answer. Come back another time. Uh, what's a good tip in making minimalist yet interesting photos? Uh, that's all about observation, about being in locations that are have potential interest. Uh, I'm fairly confident most of the places I go that I can find something, at least one photo, uh, if I can put my camera in a place that's interesting of something. There's usually textures around, there's abstract, there's light and shadow interacting. So it's instead of what we're used to as people looking at everything, you know, we're doing this, this, and this is, is, is getting closer and smaller. Think small. Um, when I want to create photos and I don't have amazing sunrises or sunsets or awesome subjects, I will think small and get closer to things and look for it like that. Look for textures and shadows and patterns and artsy fartsy stuff. Um, next question, anything I should avoid photographing? Uh, rules or secrets, subjects that never turn out good. The one thing I would say to probably never photograph would be someone else's kids without their permission. That's just creepy on every level and it's just, you know, we're sensitive to that stuff now. So that would be uh, something I would recommend never doing. You may be uh, illegally permitted to do so, but it's just not good form potentially. Uh, other subjects, I don't know. Um, again, it depends. Some people, like I don't want to see photos of spiders. Ugh, that's just yuck. Uh, but I'll look at photos of donuts. So you know, it depends on uh, the person, on uh, the person who's both creating the photo and then who their audience is or might be on what uh, is the best fit. So that's a good question, though. Uh, do, again, stay away from photos of other people's kids without their permission. That's the one thing I can think of for sure not good to do. Um, um, last question here. How do you find different photographers and the photos that they take to seek inspiration from them? Uh, so this is a great question. I think this is the last question. It's the, uh, the be a really good one to end on. Because one way to get better at photography or anything you're creating is to make yourself more aware of what's out there, what the options are, or what the possibilities are. So that means exposing yourself to potentially other creatives, whether it's a photographer, a musician, a cook, a sculptor, your mechanic on your car, um, being aware of those things and, and soaking it all in. So uh, the, here's a couple easy ways to do this. So for example, on Instagram, go to uh, a photographer you like and then go to and then go and see who they follow. So go to their following and uh, see who they follow who that, because that's probably someone they enjoy. Uh, similarly, you can do this uh, uh, same thing on, on YouTube. People who like this video also like this. So again, you're just kind of following um, the suggestions of other connected possibilities. 
So using all the tools that are out there of who's connected to who will lead you to other people. Then be selective of what would be interesting to you, uh, what seems like a good fit. Um, I think finding diversity in who you follow uh, is super important. Uh, you know, gender diversity, ethnic diversity, age diversity, uh, geographic diversity uh, is super helpful to just learn so much more about this awesome art we are uh, get to participate in and find new ways to do it. Uh, there's something to learn from just about everybody. So uh, the wider your audit your your pool of inspiration is, the more possibilities you have for creating things. So there you go. That was a long one. I'm not sure what it's going to edit down to. Where are we at on the recording? The recording is one hour and 24 minutes. I think we'll probably edit it to right around an hour because um, I had some moments in here. So anyway, you've reached the end and thank you for your attention so far. I hope you've uh, found some answers. Uh, if you would like to uh, uh, add your opinion to the answers, please do so in the comments. That's greatly appreciated. If you know I made a mistake somewhere in one of my answers, please let me know that too. I can take it. I've been known to make a mistake or two in my life. Uh, if you like this video, you know what to do. You hit that thumbs up thing. What happens when you do that is you train the algorithm, that mysterious algorithm, to know more about you and what you think is quality content. So I appreciate that. And so does the algorithm. And so will you. Uh, also, by YouTube law, I'm required to ask you to subscribe to this channel so you can see more stuff like this. Hardly ever this long. Well, four times a year it's this long. I do the Q&As four times a year. So uh, if you enjoyed this and want to see more of me talking about photography, uh, subscribe to this channel uh, for my uh, weekly videos, and uh, I'd be glad to see you then. I hope you are doing well. I hope uh, the world and life is treating you well, and I hope you get a chance to go out and create some photos, find inspiration in the creation of photos, and uh, stay well, stay healthy. And I will see you in the next video. So until then, bye for now.